Um, this is a talk series that happens at 1.30 on Tuesdays uh, at CMU Silicon Valley. Uh, we try to do it every, every week that the classes are in session. And uh, we put everything up on, on the um, CMU. Silicon Valley TOCS uh, website, so you can search on the web for CMU and talks, and uh, find find all these uh, these great uh, speakers uh, that have been through here. We've had everybody from from uh, Park and Stanford to Xerox, and and often entrepreneurs come. Um, now this is a, a special uh, week in that we have the CEO, a uh, uh, serial CEO. He's been CEO and founder of several companies, and um, um, so that's kind of exciting. Just before we get started, I'm going to turn all the mics on on um, on on the deck, and that means that if you rattle your keys and everything, we'll get that. But the main thing is that when you want to ask a question, you can we can be heard. And I, I we have people online that are listening to this talk series. We'll go to about 2:20, 2:25 with the speaker, and at that point we'll go out into the hall and we'll have some cookies and uh, and and sodas, cheap cookies, unfortunately. Um, and uh, continue, yeah, continue the conversation a little bit. Um, and uh, typically, uh, about half of the, um, uh, well, we, we have about a third as many people as in the room online, and then many people um, will, will listen to it later as well. So you might get some questions from from uh, from the listening audience somewhere else. And when you do, I will usually uh, just translate it for you and and send it to you. Um, so without further ado, um, we have uh, it's Romulus. Cabrera. Yeah. And he, as I said, has been a, a serial entrepreneur, and uh, we'll talk about his latest company. And we are extremely excited about this company because we've been trying to see if we could use it for a project that we're doing with Samsung uh, that might or might not uh, uh, work out. So, okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. Appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I wanted to, uh, so when Ted invited me to come talk, I could have done our standard marketing pitch, but I figure most of you folks, your eyes are going to glaze over if I do just that. So I said, how can I try and make this a little more apropos, a little more relevant uh, for the crowd? And uh, what we essentially do, as the title suggests on the, uh, on the screen, we are into connected devices. And our value proposition is the second part, but the one that's probably interesting from a standpoint of saying, what is a connected device? Um, sometimes some of us have the benefit uh, as entrepreneurs being on the forefront of emerging trends and, uh, and new ways of looking at the same old technology or new ways of crossing a couple of different fields together in a way that creates uh, an intersection point that creates new opportunities. In essence, it's kind of a different way of phrasing the age-old questions, and if you phrase them differently, sometimes you can actually see answers that other people didn't because they didn't ask the question in the right way. Um, sidebar, quickly, uh, as, a, as a way of, of understanding the whole rephrasing, which is really the premise around which we were built as a company. Um, if, I, if I put a glass on a table with water in it, half of it, half full or half empty, most people will go towards one or the second answer. Now, the problem is if you rephrase that question and say maybe the glass is twice as large as it needs to be, you can actually fix the problem if you're in the desert with no water. Right? So it really depends on how you phrase the question sometimes, and therefore that leads you to the solution albeit through a different path. And that's the essence of what we effectively did. Now, we didn't start out that way, but with hindsight, when we look back, we said we actually asked a set of questions in a different way, and we came to the right answer, but we came at it kind of in a novel way. So there's the, uh, there's the punchline. Now I'll jump back to the, to the beginning and do this thing from, from, from start. Connected device companies are essentially exactly what they say. There, there's this traditional world of CE devices, right? Consumer electronic devices. Everybody knows that. Those are your traditional devices. They start big and bulky, and they start moved into your personal space, and they got smaller and more portable and ultra portable, and in the end, they kind of start going everywhere with you. The problem is when you pick up and go somewhere, that most of these devices are not useful to you because uh, they can't help you be connected while you're kind of out and about. 
And so you actually have to change the way you live your life to kind of eventually make a pit stop somewhere along the destination of your life, which are now these Wi-Fi hotspots. If you were a car, if you're a gas station as a human being, it's now a Wi-Fi hotspot to eventually get connected all over again. And we said, well, that doesn't work. We have to work ourselves into the fabric of people's life. And when we did that, we started asking the question of what is the basis of a user experience? And the simple thing we concluded was the basis of the user experience is when you can make the technology disappear from them instead of asking them to interact with the technology. And so that's really what we set out to do. In our specific case, it kind of walks into this very cluttered looking picture that said, uh, we recognize that people like to capture stuff with devices. And it started with things that were hand cranks and then it moved to motorized camcorders and then portable. Eventually you ended up with ultra portable and wearable. And these followed the paradigm and the thinking that said, we will make it convenient to work into your way of life. Wearable, big market these days, people like because it helps them capture the essence of what they create frequently in their activities, what they do, that frequently defines who they are. Uh, so whether you're a snowboarder or whether you're a triathlete, whether you live an active lifestyle outside, uh, they help you capture that. They have to capture it for two reasons. One is for preservation. Um, and one is for uh, self ex expression or self-creation, because people like to do that. That's a primal need. The other one is for connecting which is where the thing came down to, from a services standpoint, we recognized that the other uh, axis that was essentially manifesting itself was the whole ability to share stuff. And so from that standpoint, we realized that it was one thing to capture things, it was another thing to be able to provide people an easy way to share. And so when we looked at that and we said, if we look at video, what, what are all the different things that people were asked to do? And it turned out that it, it was really along the lines of, you had to stop your life to go to a theater. You had to stop your life, not so much eventually, because you could then watch it at home. And you had to stop your life later on when it wasn't just broadcast, but you could record it and watch it time delayed at your own convenience. And then you could take this with DVDs and watch it wherever you wanted because you could plug it into your PC. And eventually you kind of got to streaming, which allowed you to just watch it anytime, anywhere without having to be burdened with a device. And the question we phrased was, what if you could combine the two together if you truly effectively took the consumer electronics model and the connected person model and put them together, connected device. And in our world, that's the utility of it. That's the, uh, that's the value proposition to the use. The business model side of it takes on a slightly different phrase, which is a little more insipid, a little more uh, clinical device as a service. So as a business model, we basically follow the device as a service model, where the device is an enabler to a service, and it's in the combination of the two that one essentially uh, gets, uh, gets to be able to do something interesting. I try to break up uh, kind of these days where the ecosystem, that must be me feeding back into the microphone. I've tried to break up where all the bits and pieces are. Someone wanted to focus and say, you know, I'm gonna try and go after this converged market where the world is increasingly becoming about me being connected via bits and pieces that hover around in my personal space. Uh, over time, uh, how am I going to do it? Wh what am I going to consider are important parts that I have to take on? So it's, it's actually a big task for small companies to take on this much. The problem is it's very difficult for large companies to take on stuff like this because they become very siloed in one of these areas and that's where their core competencies develop long before they have the ability to cross-pollinate them into other, other uh, uh, expertise areas or domain uh, capabilities. At, at its very essence, there is some kind of a device, whether it's a sensor, whether it's a heart monitor, whether it's, in our case, a, a hands-free recording device, and the, the key is there in our it's wearable, it's hands-free, kind of points where you look on a regular basis, and uh, you don't have to do anything. It kind of gets out of your way. Um, with the mobile devices, you actually can say, I, I've got a perfectly good compute platform. As a matter of fact, you have more compute platform now than you ever did with uh, with a small phone now giving you dual gigahertz processor capability uh, and all the apps in the world to download to it, you've essentially got a compute platform that is your tethering point to the internet. And so if you think of this as your own personal valley, your own personal access point to the rest of the world, you've kind of got that and that. That begs the next obvious question. Well, I can leverage this for whatever purpose my end application is. Uh, the way to do it is through apps. That allows you to now tie those together. So now what you've done is you've tied all of these three together as one big device 
really, because all the compute power is here, there. Why do that? Way? Well, one less thing to carry, for example. And, and not to understate that, that's a big thing for most people, one less thing to carry. Fit it into the things I already have on my belt. Don't give me one extra thing to carry around. Uh, and uh, people say, if you can make people uh, walk out of the house in the morning and pick up their keys, their wallet, their cell phone, and your device, you made a billion bucks. Simple as that. So the question is, how do you make that part of the uh, of your traveling uh, itinerary or stuff that you kind of take with you on a daily basis? However, having done just these three pieces, you kind of end up in this weird situation where it's still just a device. Albeit you've broken it up into two pieces, but uh, you kind of think of the link between them, whether you use a wired link or the wireless Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, it's still a bus. And so it's still one, one, one device. The trick to not getting commoditized in today's world as a consumer electronics, because we can never manufacture, we are great at innovating in the Western world, but when it comes time to taking it to economies of scale, we have cost bases that are so much higher because of the affluence and, and cost of, of, of living uh, that eventually it all shifts from a manufacturing standpoint overseas, and they can always make it cheaper, they can always make it better, and these days they can make it just as compelling. Because what Apple did with the, starting with the iPod and going forward was they turned industrial design into an art form, and they basically turned the, 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 the Asian manufacturers into, into, into the folks who actually provide all of this from a manufacturability standpoint. So the ability to tolerance-wise get down to such a tight fit that it no longer looks like it's a gray PC box um, is, is unsurpassable now. So now they've got the benefit of skill set, they got the uh, benefit of price model, and they got the benefit of just economies of scale from a workforce standpoint that we can't compete with. So the next question is, well, you're going to get marginalized on just the device. No one wants to either invest in a device company or, uh, or try and take a bet on a device company. Unless, of course, you can somehow tie a sticky service to it. So for kind of any successful venture to be able to think about it in terms and try to boil it down into like the four things to think of, if you can somehow tie it into a back-end service, you, you, you've got something that works. Let me use Skype as a simple example. Um, a Skype phone by itself is no good. But uh, because anyone can do the phone. But as Skype, the service, uh, the phone is very useful. But it's not useful to just the guys who make the handsets because they all marginalized. It's really the Skype folks who, who get the benefit of that. And um, the device itself is no use. However, if somebody owned both the device and the service end, now you're making money on both sides of that equation, unless you, of course, open up the, the interfaces and make them, make them commonplace, which uh, eventually, once you get large enough, like a Skype, you just turn that open and you go. Because for years, Skype was only available on PCs, and they were the only ones who basically did the apps. And they opened it and allowed people to put it on devices, inside TVs, and all kinds of other things. Take these four pieces, put them together. You got stickiness, you got uh, mobility, you've got a valuable device if it's a need, and you can actually build a whole business model around it. Let me just beat this horse to death by making uh, uh, the point one more time. Let's use the MP3 player as an example. I've got here a standard MP3 player. You need to pair that with a PC. You need to get some version of Windows, say, running on it. Uh, you've got to go find a store to download it from to get your music. And you've eventually kind of got to use a library manager of some sort or a syncer and piece all these things together. Or if you buy into the device as a service model, you just do it the way Apple does it. You take an iPod, you connect it wirelessly to iTunes, and it goes gets all its music from out there, and you got 10,000 songs in your pocket. Now, this is, I checked the price on this thing. This is $52.06 yesterday on Amazon, and this is still 149 bucks. Because the service and the user experience is compelling enough that your average person doesn't know how to string the top part together. And they can't be bothered to try and string it together. You got a PC from Dell, you got operating system from Windows, you got a music player from somewhere else. You got to go to Amazon to get your music. You got to figure out how to piece all these together. And unless you're an IT person, which the average consumer isn't, you're willing to pay extra for just the user experience. That begs the question of why not go for a combined connected device model? Makes sense. Get the service, get a device, you make a lot of money. You never see Apple, you can't find on the, on the Apple store on it a dedicated page to iTunes. You just can't. It's not sold as a service. You can find the iPod and plenty of those things, but without this, this would have been $56.02 a long time ago. Because that, it turns out, is actually a better music player, has better fidelity, and better set of uh, headphones that come with it than this one does. 
but it's a compelling user experience. So never under, uh, underestimate the user experience. A few years ago, we've all been beaten into a head that says user experience, user experience, user experience, great. But in the end, price trumps everything else. Right? And we've all gone under that, that belief for years that says, let's not put a whole lot of stuff in. There's not a whole lot of monetary worth in user experience because at the end of the day, I've just got to make it cheap and people will buy it more than all the other stuff. Appealing to the lowest common denominator in people's uh, habits rather than essentially going to the aspirational or highest common numerator type of stuff. Why? That lowest common denominator is the bigger end of the pyramid. It's a lot easier to cater to that than the top one. Well, it turned out in 2008 when the financial markets collapsed, um, everybody tanked who was selling on a just price value proposition. They couldn't sell their stuff. Apple not only held steady, but they kind of went up. So that was kind of the first time we got to see that proposition in work that says, no, it is strong. And it has legs, and it will withstand a battering, and it continues to, it, it really means something. And ever since then, a lot of people have realized that you don't sell user experience short. And if you're going to provide a product or a device, you really should consider providing the whole system or be able to make sure that you can integrate the whole solution together so it doesn't look like a bunch of puzzle pieces that someone has to piece together. It looks like a complete picture without all the puzzle scenes in it. So it looks like the box top rather than the finished puzzle. And that really is kind of the difference between saying go for, that's the real essence at the end of the day behind the connected device paradigm and the user as a, and the device as a, as a service model. Going to shift into us a little bit and use that as a backdrop to kind of say, okay, so how did we come at it? What was the problem we solved? Where, where What did we do in the end that realized that whole thinking? So the problem we tried to solve was, well, the world's more active, the world's more mobile, the world's out and about, and the problem is that video capture is not integrated well into people's social sharing needs. And the question was, why not? Because of all the ways that people can share digitally, video is probably the most compelling way to do. It is definitely more richer than audio. It's more richer than text. It uh, conveys a real contextual uh, setting as well as a full experience than, than do just a single picture. Because if you think about it, video is 30 frames a second, so well, that's 30 pictures a second. And if every picture is worth a thousand words, in one second you gain 30,000 words across. I'll just do it mathematically and just show that, you know, there you go, I've just conveyed more information via one second worth of video than I could ever with one picture. But yet, no one does that. If you go look on Facebook, you'll find that 80% of everything up there is quick text. The other 20% is basically pictures. And the rest, a little minuscule amount is a video here, video there, and all the other random bits and pieces. And we ask the question, why not? Well, it's because these camcorders were designed to be tripods. They were designed to be put up there, capture everything, and post-edit it. They came out of the movie industry, camcorders. They were did ready action. Right? Well, life doesn't work that way. Life basically kind of happens when it happens, and you got to be able to go back and go, gee, something just happened. Interesting. Where, the, where was the camera when I needed it? So that was the first thing we said. These are not designed for a mobile world. They're really designed for a stationary world. And, and they're really painful. Because if you look at this stuff, I mean, I, I frequently feel like this guy out there when I'm carrying a couple of different things around. And, and I do photography for a hobby, so I actually have a couple of those lenses, uh, it turns out. And, and I've got about 12 pounds worth of gear I, I, I hike around. I've got young kids, and you need to carry a big camera if you have young kids because they're doing a lot of sports, and you're frequently on the other end of the field, and you don't want blurry pictures, and so you end up feeling like this guy frequently. I said, this is a mess. There's got to be a better way to do it. The other thing I was, was uh, ran into was... Uh, we were, when my kids were even younger, it was their uh, holiday play, Christmas play. And uh, not just me, a whole bunch of dads doing uh, this, viewing life through a lens. And so that said one of two things. You either are the videographer, you're enjoying it, you can't do both. And so we phrased the question, like the gas glass half full, why can't you be both? Can you be both? Was the question we asked. And basically once we had that question, we freed ourselves from the thinking that says you can't be both because we actually asked the question actively rather than passively accepting the answer. And it turns out you can't. You just have to combine a couple of different things and get there. So we then said, OK, let's study the case and go down that path. We started looking at where camcorders have evolved. And we realized that flip and wearable camcorders made it easier. And what, what, why they made it easier was the flip, as you folks know, has this big red button. And the simplicity of it is that, well, you just push it on and turn it off, and it does the stuff. Well, it turned out that right about when the flip got popular, uh, there was enough broadband to the PC that allowed you to move your pictures upstream and get things onto Shutterfly and things like that. Um, but no one had really solved the problem of saying, I shoot video. 
and a shot on a digital handy cam. And now I've got to get two hours worth of footage off of tape onto my PC. And then I have to transcode that into a YouTube format. And it takes two hours to transcode two hours worth of footage. Plus I need a big PC, lots of memory. Mess, you couldn't get your user generated content. So while the world was going to HD, the flip guy came out with a 480p VGA camcorder. And, and the whole media trashed them. Because, well, you know, what, they weren't following the right progression on the alphabet soup of, uh, of acronyms. So people said, this is great. I plug this into my PC. I take the video. I put it right up on YouTube. I'm done. The user experience for the need to get user-generated content in a way that they could share was enabled by these guys first. That's the real value they brought to the whole thing. Uh, the red button was just taking it to the next level of saying we're just going to push the easy-to-use model that makes it a no-brainer. Get the technology out of the way, because prior to that, if you look, every camcorder was focused on more zoom, more buttons, more features. Right? They were getting much, much more complicated and bulky. That's the way that traditionally consumer electronics tried to, try to solve the world problem. No one wants to go simpler, because the belief is if you go simpler, it's too easy to copy, you'll be out of business more quickly. Well, the thing is, you buy a lot of loyalty in your customer base if you actually make it so simple, because if they love the user experience, they will not go anywhere else regardless of how simple it is. So the thing is, actually, there is there is there's stickiness in keeping it simple. It's counterintuitive, but it actually does work. So these guys made it easy, and what we realized was the problem was this in the end. It was still stop and go, because you eventually had to get to a PC, because they solved this for the PC ecosystem, not for a mobile ecosystem. And as many of you folks know, if you ever capture stuff on a camcorder, when's the time you finally empty it out? When it's full and someone says, I need that thing to record again, right? And then this becomes an archive because at that point, you can't do anything with it. And we did a couple of focus groups and user study groups, and we asked the question, if you record something interesting, remotely interesting, if you could share it right there and then, as opposed to if you waited to get home, would you? The answer turned out to be yes. Uh, particularly, we have lots of dead time during the day. By the time you get home, the further you get away in time from it, the more interesting it has to be for you to keep being compelled just to share it. Or someone has to keep bugging you to say, can you email me that, can you email me that, can you email me those pictures before you actually get around to it. So we said, well, we now live in a, wor in a world that's on the go all the time. And if you look at the stop and go model as opposed to an on the go model, it begs a whole different use of the same pieces but pieced together in a different way so that you can effectively get stuff out there. So based on that, we said, what are we? We said, OK, there are four pieces that we really are. A hands-free. Hands-free is very important because in an active world, you've got to, your life requires both hands. That's the essence of it. Right? The second piece we said was, uh, uh, it's got to be able to share instantly. You've got to be able to, with one click or literally by doing nothing, be able to share something that just happened. That led us to the next question, well, how do you get the past? Or you have to record everything, and you have to then have people edit it uh, to just take the snippets out so they can mail. Well, that means now you've got to stop. You've got to take time out of your life. It's just not going to happen. We said, well, if there's a way to essentially keep recording the past, uh, can we go back and get whatever somebody needed? And that's where we just kind of folded in the concept that Tivo had started years earlier, which was Paul's Life TV. So we said, great, we'll just put a whole kind of buffer in there that wraps around every five hours and just records continuously for five hours in one big loop. And if you don't do anything with it, it won't. It'll just write over the old stuff because it'll assume that and want to save it. If in five hours you can't be bothered to go back and get something, chances are it's not important enough. But we said, well, so that's five hours. How do we get the most interesting snippet? We put a little button right at the bottom of that thing. And uh, if you can see this, there's a little button down here that allows you to, when you push that button, it'll go right there and then capture from that point backwards 30 seconds to the last 30 seconds, turn that into a, into a video clip, save it on the device, and through your phone, push it wherever you want. Yeah, brilliant. Just an easy way to go back and get the last 30 seconds. So something just happened, push the button. You got it. It's saved. It's shared. You don't have to worry about the rest. The essence there was we've got to get this out quickly with minimal interaction, make it simple. This was our equivalent of the, the flip big red button, in essence. So that's what this was. Flashback, get the stuff in there. Well. It made us have to think of a camcorder in a slightly different way, which was, um, well, you don't really record everything. You're really capturing stuff. And are you really saving stuff or recording it? And we had to go back and redefine all of the words that people were so comfortable with, because in our world, recording and capture and saving all meant different things. 
and was going to be too easy to confuse people. And it turned out it, we did confuse a lot of people when we first came out with this, because people would turn the thing on, they'd see it record, and they'd stop, and they'd plug it into their PC and go, where's my clip? I go, well, it's not quite there. Not until you tell it to actually save it will it actually save something for you in a visible form. It's all there in the raw stuff. You can suck that stuff up and edit it when you want. But you've got to actually kind of go through this paradigm. And we had to go back and walk people through that model by giving them another app that basically gave them their standard camcorder function, where when they turn the record button on, it start recording, and when they stop, it stop recording, so that they, we could walk them in two steps into this concept of recording from the past as opposed to recording them forward in time. Yes? Um, yeah, you know, good question. Why 30 seconds? So we, we spent a lot of time going back and looking at what the average length of clips are out there where people got bored. And we found that some people believe that 12 seconds is all people could sustain. And we found a lot of folks who in the end said, you know, if, if, if it's interesting content, people will watch it for minutes. Uh, but then we looked at the thing and we said, the commercials are 30 seconds. Seems to hold people's attention. 30 seconds. But if you, if you think about, you know, events in the world that are interesting, you know, like if you think about the plane crash in Reno or, or something right. like that, I mean, there's a lot more than 30 seconds of interesting stuff. Absolutely. So for those people, we said, we said, look, if there's 30 seconds, we've got to give you a button. But if you want anything more, get the phone out. We actually allow through the app people to scrub through the last five hours to any point in there by just moving a slider around with the timestamp that moves. You find a position, you say start here, end here, save that. So you can save up to five hours worth of stuff there. But we, this is the instant flashback stuff that says something just happened as I'm out there, guy on a unicycle went by, flip, got it, move on, uh, type of stuff. This, this, is to, this, this part gets you unexpected moments. Anything else, you've got five hours to go back and collect as much of it as you want. And get out there. Now we've got models that'll let you go back 10 hours and 15 hours just to function how much flash that we want to put on there. But they're good question. So we, we broke it down into the part that says we make it easy to get stuff right there. If you miss it, don't worry. You can just get your phone out when you have time. You've got five hours to find some dead time in your day to get that to go back and, uh, and, and, and flip that. We did those, and then people said, well, you know, if you're going to go all the way to that point, you've got to give me real time streaming. And this is two steps short of effectively giving me all the pieces I want, which is not just capture stuff, but share it in real time. So we said, fine, great, we'll just give you real time, uh, real time personal streaming. And we did it in an interesting way, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But uh, we have a phone, and the phone is tethered via either Wi-Fi, 4G, or 3G uh, to the outside world. So we've got the connectivity to the internet. So at that point, <coughs> it was just a matter of adapting video and compression well enough to be able to provide a nice viewing experience Optimize for smoothness of motion rather than quality of each frame because the human eye hates jerkiness more than it hates a bad looking picture. And so trying to be adapt that in real time for a 3G, 4G, or Wi-Fi type network became an important consideration towards the overall user experience. So getting real time sharing was not hard. That was the easy part. Doing it in a way that actually preserved the viewability across all the variabilities and vagaries of the, of the mobile network, that really became the huge, huge challenge. So we started out and we said, you know, on the live streaming side, we said, again, this is all trying to tie it to the user experience. What is it that people want to do? We looked and we saw that there were a bunch of folks doing live casting, if you would. This is the stuff, the Ustreams, the live streams, quicks, et cetera. Take video, put it up there for the whole world to see, and off you go. What we found from talking to a lot of those folks was, one, it's not very compelling to hold a camera up and videotape your life. For the simple reason, it turns out, when you're broadcasting to total strangers, it takes on average about 25 minutes for someone to stumble across your feed. So for the first 25 minutes, you're basically broadcasting to nowhere. And you know, 25 minutes, your arm gets tired pretty easily, and you give up very quickly. So it turns out a lot of the live casting models are fundamentally flawed in that the reason why I'm broadcasting is so someone can see me, but I can't get them to watch me fast enough or in real time enough that I kind of give up, and then the whole model just kind of collapses in on itself because of lack of usage. Because if no one's broadcasting, then no one wants to go and watch something. And it's a bit of a chicken and an egg problem there. So we said, well, you know, that doesn't work. Plus, for us, a lot of times, this camera is in very personal situations. It's in, uh, it's either in your home, it's where you've got friends, family, extended people around, it's where you're living a your life with folks that you care about. Uh, so I'll be pretty much sure that people want to be careful who they broadcast this to. So we went for a kind of a personal cast or group cast model. And we said, depending on the situation, you decide to start broadcasting 
uh, turns on the camera, starts streaming to the phone. In real time, you get to decide who you want to broadcast to, depending on the situation. So in this instance, let me use this as an example. Just assume those are my, 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 my seven-year-old playing uh, soccer, and I want to broadcast to friends and family spread around the world and my mom. Um, first thing that happens, I pick all of those people. They all get push notifications right there and then. I've solved the first problem that the live casting guys couldn't do, which is let people know right away that I'm online and I'm broadcasting, the essence of a TV guide. Uh, why can I do that? Well, because they're in my contact list, and before I could even broadcast to them, like Skype, I had to go invite them to become part of my, uh, and like Facebook, I had to invite them to become friends. Once they said, okay, now they're in there, and I can basically push notifications to them. So we got rid of the whole uh, total stranger model and said, now we have a way of notifying, which means quickly people can get online, start watching me, and I get that instant fulfillment. System starts broadcasting, and uh, it starts sending out these little presents. Uh, information notifications, which are these little motion thumbnails that we have that kind of suggest what's going on in a little thumbnail model. As soon as any one of the people I've invited start jumping on and they click on the thumbnail for me, which suggests to them I'm online, they start getting full motion audio and video and they can start watching me. And uh, we implemented a kind of a click to talk model where they can hold and chat with me back and forth so they can participate in the event uh, to, some, to, to some degree. Now, we realized at some point that the whole world, as much as we'd like to assume that the smart own war is over and everybody has one of these things, but they don't. Uh, some people basically would still like to watch it on a, uh, across a URL or, or on a web, and some people actually, like my mom, who doesn't have one of those two, but wants to see that and is compelled enough that I will actually go get her a service like that, uh, wants to watch it on her TV. So that's basically where she gets all her content and entertainment. Uh, it turns out the older generation, if uh, they hate digital pictures, um, because somebody has forces them, they have to go to a PC to watch that because they can't go down to Walgreens and get them anymore in, in paper form. Uh, but all of a sudden there was a shift in heart when they could basically start watching it on the TV again. Even though it's the same digital content, and this is a screen and that's a PC and it all looks the same, but where it's situated in the house was a big barrier to acceptance and, and, and allow them to get there. So we'll stream it to all these places. And then the next thing we realized was, well, I may be ready to broadcast what I'm doing, but someone may not be ready to watch me right then, but they'll want to watch it two hours later. So we created the concept of a DVR in the cloud and we said, fine, we'll hold it in there for some period of time and you can replay the people who invited it whenever they wanted to. All of this is starting to get to the point of saying, make it as easy for people to watch it on their time, weave into their life as opposed to force people to stop and interact with you when they want to. The big challenge, the big difference therefore between what we do and what video chat is, Google Hangouts, uh, Tango, FaceTime, Skype, Ring, all of these things is, if I want to create a Hangout on Google, and if no one else of the other nine people I invited are ready there, I'm stuck. I can't have a conversation unless there's somebody else there. right? So I can't move my activity along until someone joins in on the other side of the video conference or video chat, because it is an active act of communication. And that requires somebody else. Shine. If no, no one answers it, I gotta find time later. I can't finish that, that dialogue then. In our world, I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm going. If anyone's watching me there, great. If they're not watching me then, they can come back later. And that's where we put a monetization model around this. How long this sticks around is a function of a paid service. This is where the device as a service stuff should come in for us as a monetizable part of the whole equation. Uh, if something interesting happens from a broadcast and you want to save it permanently, well, we'll turn around and provide storage on the cloud to be able to do this. Uh, and then from there, you can send it wherever you want. And so, in essence, the whole live streaming stuff, which turned out to be a personal task model that no one had actually ever done before, just started from the simple thing of us saying, how do we just keep making it easier and easier and easier and easier for people to adopt this? So we started with all the requirements and worked backwards into the solution. Uh, this is a kind of another picture of kind of, of the same thing. Device to the uh, phone app. You can either put clips up or go live. So it's kind of a choice of being able to do the two things. We covered the whole continuum from a timeline standpoint. We said, you want to start recording from here on forward? Fine. You want to start recording and then go back and get interesting things? Fine. Or you want to go live? Fine. Go forward, go back, go live. So we took essentially the traditional camcorder paradigm and instead of it being from the time you start recording to the time you stop, we basically said, yeah, we'd like to kind of stretch this as much as possible. And if we can ever get to an infinite battery source, then it basically is a continuous timeline of stuff.
Um, some of this stuff, this hands-free stuff is very compelling, it turns out. It, just, just think of it simply put, right? It may not be interesting stuff to basically take days of your life and archive them. Um, but take a generation or two from now, if they can go back and see that footage of their parents when they were kids, from their grandparents' point of view, there is there's a very, very compelling connect, uh, connection to the past there. And we're finding all kinds of interesting other things pop up just along those lines of saying this is somebody's personal experience, a very personal kind of way of looking at things. And that, in essence, is, uh, is what, we, uh, what we do and why we do it and what the whole connected device piece is for us and 210, 20 minutes. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused about how I find anything. I've got you know, all of these clips, 30 seconds, five hours, so forth and so on. I, I might as well, I, where, where do I archive them? How do I find them? How do I search for them? Uh, how do I search for other people's? Uh... Right, so th you know, th there's, uh, there's definite, absolutely, right? Co creating mountains of information, mountains of data, is the end of one problem is the beginning of the other problem, uh, which is great. I, I've actually got stuff that I never would have had. And then the next question is, great, I got stuff I never would have had, and I got too much of it. Right, so now that begs the, we saw one half of the coin on that one. We consciously stayed away from the other one because we said there are people that that's a whole problem in and of itself. Where we realized that there was value without even solving that half of the problem is in a world that increasingly uses vi video to communicate what's going on right then as opposed to archiving and saving for later on. There are, there are, there are two different users. There is a user that says, look, this is important. I want to save this and I want to go back to it later and live life. In that model, uh, I want to re-experience life afterwards. In that model, you absolutely want to capture in as much high definition fidelity with as much stereo fidelity as possible because 10 years, five years, eight years, 12 years down the road, when you go back and look at that, the more, the more richly it was saved, the more it mimicked an immersive experience, the better your recall it turns out to be, right? So you want to do that. So there is value in saving that. We went on the complete opposite spectrum that says, as a social sharing, as a communication tool, there's a whole generation of people that basically go, watch this and never come back to it because it's kind of done, it's fast, it's a way of getting a sound bite or a snippet out. So we said we're going to go after that group of people, uh, but there will be mountains of data there for archival purposes, et cetera. Today, we're just shoveling it up in the cloud and holding it there and we're waiting for somebody to now start mining that and creating a different opportunity. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. That's really cool. So um, as you said, you're doing a longer lens to the games with your children to get like sharp pictures. Yeah. So uh, my question is, you, you capture a really wide angle, I, I suppose. Yeah. So how do you get the detail out of it? I mean, if, if I have a really wide thing and something happens like on the other end of the room, it's right. already really hard to recognize. How do you yes, it is. It? So the way to think about these kind of devices, they're the B-roll of your life. In other words, we get plenty of video footage where you'll be watching stuff and then you'll see a camera come up in the middle of this thing. Uh, or you'll see a camera held up here and take a picture because what this allows you to do is capture the, the essence of everything going on around you. Uh, things that you need to, you will frame them and shoot them. Because zooming very much, we, we, we toyed with putting zooming into, the, into our device. The problem is zooming is an act of framing. You actually have to see something to frame it. And if you zoom in too far and you don't know where it's pointing, it could be pointing up, down, and pretty soon people go, that's it, I'm just pulling out to the widest field and letting it sit there. Uh, there is a, there are, there are use, it doesn't solve all, all problems. Right? Otherwise you end up with a giant lens on, on your head. What it does is it solves, which may actually <laughs> happen one day soon. Uh, we've got the guy who embedded a camera in his uh, in his eyeball, and all you need is basically some fluid dynamics and some ability to to bend some uh, optical characteristics around a stack of uh, fluid, and there you go. You got a big giant lens. Um, comes with its own set of problems, but someone will solve those. Um, but the uh, just take a soccer game as an example. If I'm the coach. There's stuff that happens right around me uh, when all the kids come to the sideline. I can't get that stuff. Uh, when we're baseball, we have baseball coaches who will just stand there on the side and they will talk through the pitch to the batter, knowing that it's all getting recorded. And after the batter hits, he'll spend five seconds or six seconds making a commentary on that particular play, snippet it, email it, done. He's voiced over, he's coached, he's talked, he's captured everything, and he moves on to the next thing. Definitely plenty of use cases from that standpoint. But it really is 
devices like this are designed for your personal space, 10, 15 feet around from you. Anything beyond that, you really have to go get the other mod modality. Uh, I'm wondering if you are planning to add some sensors in that device, because I'm working in indoor positioning field, and I'm thinking what kind of devices to put for this kind of work here. Um, the answer is uh, yes and no. We decided we're going to leverage whatever is in the mobile phone. So for example, the, the handset has a GPS in it. If that's accurate enough, great, we'll use that. Um, if, if there's other stuff in there, like time, all that, we just get that all from the phone. So insofar as we can leverage what's there, we, we do. If we can't leverage what's there and it doesn't compromise the wearability of it, it's not bulky enough or compromise battery, we, uh, we stay away from it. The filter we use is, is it a must to have or a nice have? For, for the markets we go after. Not to say that the thing in its essence can't be taken and retargeted. I'll give you a simple example. I talked about all the consumer stuff. We actually do stuff for uh, for the intelligence community too. We've got some stuff we do for the CIA, we stuff we do for Homeland Security. And through a company called Taser, you guys all heard of the Taser gun, we actually, our, our, device, our cameras have been repackaged in a ruggedized form factor and combined with their backend software. Uh, that starting at the end of this year, next year you'll start seeing you basically push to law enforcement around the country for the simple reason that everybody records cops and cops don't have a way to record the situation back in, in the event that in, in, in the instance that there's a PR issue, uh, no one can tell the difference between a well-edited selected clip and actually what happened that led up to that, uh, to that point. Um, but in that instance, uh, cops had a whole different set of requirements they needed in these devices. Uh, they needed wider angle, they needed very low light capability, they needed much more accurate GPS, they needed video tampering uh, or pr uh, proof against video tampering, they needed non-video tampering capabilities and all that other stuff. So insofar as it does uh, not compromise the wearability, yes. Um, insofar that it does start to get into the fundamental usability of the core value proposition, best to stay away from it. Um, YouTube, search for Lipsy. Plenty of, uh, that, that's the easiest way I can. Uh, I, I, I guess I. Um, so. The tour guide, you're here. I'm going to, Wait, uh, where's the uh, keyboard? Here, here we go. How do I stop this thing? Let me see if I can find. I'm going to show you one interesting one. I think the words I'm looking for is Lipsy Jackass. Oh. <laughs> the problem is that word jackass starts giving me other. Uh... There we go. Is this the one here? Let me change this to. This is a guy in a Prius doing 52 in the fast lane <laughs> and rush hour traffic. Hey, what happened? Screen froze. Now, see, I, I managed to do this to machines. <laughs> yeah, let's try this thing again. <coughs> yeah, I'll do, I'll do this version. That's it. There he goes. <laughs> no, it's a motorcycle doing a wheelie in rush hour traffic at 50 miles an hour in the fast lane. Now, you, uh, you, uh, it doesn't like full screen. There we go. Let me let me put this right here. I'll see if I can pause this somewhere in the middle. So I'll tell you an interesting thing that happened. So two months later, that guy sees the video. Um, and uh, a buddy of his sends it to him and goes, isn't that you? He goes, yeah. So the guy calls up our marketing and goes, uh, hey, if you guys send me a free look -see, I'll get you some even more interesting footage. <laughs> Did you? I kid you not. 
Absolutely. We did. We did. We always take free footage. Otherwise, it costs us money to generate that kind of stuff. <laughs> what else did he send you? Well, wait. We're seeing. This was about two weeks ago. He finally sent this <laughs> in. Um, this is uh, the guy who posted this had an interesting quote. He said, "I hate 880, or as I like to call it, the Raider Nation transportation system." Um, and uh, you couldn't get this any other way. You don't even know it's going to happen until after stuff like this happens. Um, there's stuff about people doing unicycles down. Um, we had this one guy do a demo video for us at Australia because we kind of like his sense of humor and the quirkiness in his accent and all that stuff. And uh, while he was out there, he got a unicyclist in downtown Sydney basically just riding on the middle of rush hour traffic, cutting in and out of traffic on a unicycle. <laughs> What does the test video look like? It looks like a more mundane, kind of sitting around with the family. Does the second one up in the right column? The second one, yeah. You see a couple more? Yeah. Let's yeah see so what it's, it's, a, it's kind of a mundane. No, so this around. one, I believe, was uh, just someone walking around New York City. Uh, how about this one down here? Jeans <laughs> taking out on subway platform? Yeah. Here's a guy who commutes to work on his unicycle. Wow, lots of noise. Uh, Nerf gun battles. <laughs> Strap the camera to the top of it. Here's someone. There we go. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Ugly truck sighting. I have no idea what that is. Uh, here's a guy who, uh, so this guy took our lens off, put an IR lens on the front because he tracks paranormal activity. <laughs> If you go to his website, you will uh, understand why he did that. Same guy did the same thing. Same guy did this. Yeah, there you go. That's me. Here's a guy who basically picked this up in a plane. I'm in a plane. Let me find. The same guy did a Christmas video for his parents. Let me see if here we go. All right, so this one. <laughs> it is. Watch this. So he's a radio personality, and when he first saw this come out, he basically said, his creative juices started going. <laughs> so he did an interesting trick. Just send it to us. Ah, 150. The service will, well, the service, there, there's a basic free service. So people don't have to do anything other than use the basic free service, gives them a few number of hours a month type of stuff for, for broadcasting. And then we charge for all the extra stuff, the replay and the archiving and all the other bits and pieces. So, and, and, and it goes on that way. The guy uses an interesting uh, style. He puts things, see if I can find that. Oh, he started using a mirror as a way of uh, having the dialogue back and forth. Um, and then it became his thing. He started using it in every other video he made. Uh, here's somebody who basically stuck, stuck it on a windshield mount. Uh, 
and then they stuck it on. We have a fisheye lens that basically snaps on playing Beatles music. Water skiing. Could you talk about the history of your 30 second uh, you know, function as an alternative to Twitter? Um, um, yes, we have. I mean, we have that, that's something people have to kind of discover all on their own. Well, but it, it also gives us a ideas. Twitter. Yeah, well, there's video Twitter already out there. But, but, it, but is it like, uh, isn't it just telling a different animal? It, it is, it is. Um, it is, you know, it's there's so many different things we're chasing down right now, but that actually is a good idea. That's just a montage of different things. You know, the water skiing thing in the beginning, people kept asking us, image stabilization, image stabilization, image stabilization. And uh, we kept saying, you know, we can't seem to find it because that water skiing thing at the very beginning, let's see if I can find it. Oh, wait, you got to see this one, though. This is this awesome golfer. I took a swing, missed, that's me. <laughs> the boat driver, this thing is moving, and you can see how stable it is. It turns out, interestingly, it turns out, interestingly, you have no fast twitch muscles in your head because you never break your head, you never break a fall with your head, you break it with your hand, so you need to move quickly, there are diverse stuff coming at your face. And it's, it's fast twitch muscles that create the twitching, which is basically the jitter that needs to be taken out with image stabilization. Add that, that to the fact that your brain is a big counter dampening force, so it basically takes out even all of the, uh, the other Poisson bits and pieces out of there, so it smooths out the sine curve in, in the end. And that uh, you've got uh, shock absorbers in your, in your vertebrae and across your organs coming up through your, through your, through your middle. By the time, anything that's basically vibrating that your feet's in contact with, that's completely been canceled or taken out. And it turns out, because you have no fast twitch muscles, uh, your head stays extremely stable and pointed in one direction uh, if you do that. Hence the phrase zoning out, where your ability to just stare at one spot in space uh, and not move at all. It turns out, when you put it on somebody's head, you've got a built-in human tripod with image stabilization and big dampening effects all built in, and it points where you need it to point. And that's the beauty of getting anything above the head. But it brings us design challenges. It has to be comfortable, and it has to meet the need of long cycle time and all that other kind of stuff. And heat, brain tumors, yeah, it goes on and on. I think maybe uh, if there's one last question, we'll ask that, or else we'll just out and have a little uh, snack. Anybody got a question? How long does the battery run? So the battery runs for anywhere from two hours to four hours. If you're running in full on 480, 30 frames a second type of stuff, it'll run for two hours. If you're willing to do it at like more half VGA, 15 frames a second, which is what the streaming speed is on a 3G, because you, know, very you have about 200, use, 200 kilobits per second of usable bandwidth on the upstream of a 3G. So in that case, we basically stretch the battery life out and make the, the video smaller from that standpoint. So it depends on the use case people want to do it. We find some people just archive their lives in big chunks. They run it on maximum battery. And some people are trying to optimize it for quality in a certain time to run it on lower battery. But what's nice is that these battery charges now have fast charge, charge circuitry. So in an hour and a half, the whole thing's back up and running. And if you plug it into a juice pack, uh, you can get, you know, for five minutes, you can get another 15, 20 minutes of extended life built onto it. So it's easy to on the fly keep these things going. So we're not going to try and solve it by putting bigger batteries. We're going to count on the fact that other people in the world make it easier to just give a quick boost back to your battery because you've got to do it anyway. Your phone will, uh, the phones dial off faster than our device dial. So if you're streaming and streaming through your phone, your phone's going to run out of battery before we run out of battery. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. It's been great. My pleasure. Um, let's uh, meet outside instead of at the podium just because it frees up the room. I want to just uh, remark that next week we have a chip designer from, uh, from Stanford.